Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we are continuing our focus on the environment and looking for the best ideas that we can to help inform not only all Americans but also the government on how it is that we can better clarify what we should be working on and how it is that we can contribute to this great earth. Or as I like to say, without earth, nothing else matters. I had this great conversation with someone this morning when we were uh, just, just getting ready. It was a gentleman who pours concrete for a living. And he said, you know, JJ, what the real problem with government is, it's the same as what I do in my job. And I thought, how is he going to connect pouring concrete to the government? But you know what? He nailed it. And this is what he said. He said that we have a problem in my industry where all the people making decisions have never actually done the job. And I said, my goodness, sir, you completely hit the nail on the head. And he said, so what ends up happening is we have decision makers who are not fully informed of the complexities and the tactical things that need to occur in order for change to happen. And so that's what is fueling our trip around the country. And that is why today we're meeting with an expert who works in the field so that as we make these plans, they're not only informed, but they are informed by the best. So today we're meeting with Dr. Fowler, who's going to tell you a little bit about himself and the research project that he's doing, focused on saving the turtles, but also, you might learn, that it is a broader impact to the environment, to animals, and to humans to be able to learn. So, I pass it to you. Give us your intro spiel. Sure. Yeah, well, I'm the research director of a nonprofit seizure project out of Savannah, Georgia. And we've been collecting data on the loggerheads that nest on the, an island off Savannah for the last 47 years. So we have a lot of data, and we use those data to not only inform um, environmental management of the sea turtles and their populations, um, but also we use it as a tool to bridge the divide between the public and science. So we have volunteers that come out and help us do all the research on the sea turtles. They collect the data, uh, they patrol the beach with us, and they see scientists in action, they can be a part of it themselves. Very cool. And so when you patrol the beach, tell me what that looks like. Okay, we drive um, two different Kawasaki mules up and down the beach, and we're looking mostly for the adult females and frogs. So okay. sea turtles live in the ocean for most of their lives, but they become accessible when the females come on the beach to lay their eggs. And that's when we uh, go out on the beach and try to intercept them to put tags in them. Like we give an individual tag that tell us who that female is. By doing that, what that allows us to track those females throughout their reproductive lives. It gives us information on um, what the population size is in, how the size it is, how the populations are changing, um, and some of the intricate details about how the sea turtles are, are living. Wow, and so what made you passionate about sea turtles? Uh, well, they're, they're fascinating creatures. I've, I've always loved reptiles, but to have a reptile that lives in the ocean is pretty amazing. So they have all sorts of neat adaptations for that. Um, they're huge, you know. They're 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 some of the biggest reptiles in the world. Um, they've Give got, me a size range. Well, the adult females we have are about a meter long. They're shell length. So add a head and a tail, you've got a pretty big animal, 250, 300 pounds. So when they crawl up the beach, they leave a nice big crawl in the sand. And that's what we actually look for when we're looking for the turtles, because we're trying not to disturb them. So we drive and we look for the crawls, and then we can go up and see and see what they're doing. And when they go when they lay their eggs, they actually go into a trance like state. So. We can actually get in there while they're laying their eggs and collect samples, collect body size measurements, and then once they leave, we'll protect the eggs. So they're not aware of their surroundings during this time. Is that what makes them vulnerable? Um, I mean, if you had predators, they would be not be able to defend themselves. They're not very, they don't, don't defend themselves very well on the beach anyway. You've got an animal that's been in the water for 30 plus years and never touched the ground, all of a sudden it's lugging a huge body up the beach. But we don't have a lot of predation on the adults in Georgia, so. They can sort of sit there and be, be very calm while we're, while we're looking around, but not, not too stoked about it. And so, um, what do you think it is from an adaptation perspective that has them coming onto the beach versus staying in the water? Because they do spend so much of their time there. Yeah, well, the fact that they lay their eggs in the, on the ground is an evolutionary relic of the fact that they turtles evolved on land. So they've always laid their eggs on land. It would be really beneficial to turtles to have their babies out of the ocean. Yeah. Where there are but there is an evolutionary history to them that, that keeps them tied to the land. Yeah, because it opens up uh, a lot of possible problems for them. Doesn't yeah, it? And, it does. and also for the little ones, correct? That's oh, where yeah. you really is the, is the concern. Yep. So if there's not predators on the beach that are coming after them, what are the concerns for the little ones making it just being 
you know, do you travel through the water or is it? Well, uh, during the 60-day 60, 60 incubation, they've noticed a lot of predators attacking the eggs. And then the, the time from the nest to the ocean is a very vulnerable time as well. Because there's lots of little things that eat, eat little turtles. And then once they make it to the ocean, you've got nearshore predators like sharks and birds and other big predatory fish that eat them. But once they get out in the open ocean, they become a, a very small needle in a huge haystack. Sure, so sure. that's that's where they spend a lot of their developmental years because they're just they're, they're not accessible to many predators out there in the open ocean. You just have to do a Darwin parkour to get out there. Yeah. yeah. So we lose a lot of turtles in that first period, yeah. but but that's what their biology is. Yeah. We invest a lot of money in our children to keep them, through time and money and effort to keep them alive. But a mama sea turtle just basically lays, lays a hole in the ground and gives them a little bit of yolk and says, you're on your own. Um, so so that's kind of normal to have that little investment and you have a lot of mortality. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up parenting because uh, on, on one hand, one of the things that is uh, really great about people having children later in life is now we have the capability to give our children lots of things we didn't have as, as youngsters ourselves. However, the flip side is that we actually take away from that natural challenge that exists. And so I have to say, people have children in their early 20s. They aren't fully formed as human uh, adults either. So the children have to learn to deal with their parents and have to grow up with their parents. how the turtles either are affected by climate change or the ecosystem that is affected by climate change and or has an effect on the climate and the larger system. Well, um, there's a couple different ways that climate change can be seen. So they nest on, most of the sea turtles nest on very dynamic beaches, which are designed to come and go, and the turtles can come and go as the beaches move and change. But when we put structures along the beach, then those natural changes prevent, or the, the, the human obstacles prevent those natural changes from happening. And with climate change, we've got a lot greater and higher intensity storms, which are changing those, those beach habitats more frequently, which affect the nesting habitat of the sea turtles. The other kind of interesting thing that ties in climate change and it's a really cool piece of sea turtle biology is that sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination. So they don't have an oh. XX, XY chromosomes yeah, for males or females. That it's the middle middle chunk of the temperature during incubation that dictates the sex. So in an increasingly warming world, there's some really scary data coming out of Florida and Queensland, Australia, where we've got feminization of sea turtle populations. Almost every hatchling on those beaches are females. Um, so that's probably that's a, one of the big concerns in the sea turtle world right now. So we, in order to plan ahead for that kind of thing, we think about how sea turtles could adapt to that. And one is a northern shift or a southern right, shift right, in the southern right, hemisphere. Sure. So these big populations like in Florida might then need Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, maybe even you know, places where turtles don't nest right now in the future that are cooler, where so they're producing both males and females. Um, so those are, those are two of probably the biggest things, storm activity and, and temperature. So how, how does the temperature change? Is it because of when the egg is, is growing and developing that it actually changes the way the chemicals are released? Yeah, there's a, there's a physiological okay. response. Yeah, yeah, yeah because that's what happens to a human. Yeah. 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 So it's it's not as, it's not at at uh, at fertilization where you get no you tell. It's, right. It's it's along the way, so it's right. a physiological response to the genes. Huh. Very interesting. Wow. Very cool. Um, and so to flip that, right? What is the effect of sea turtles on the other the rest of the ecosystem? So maybe not affecting climate per se yeah. um, directly. I wouldn't think they're as practical as wrong there. But they do have, you know, they're in the food chain somewhere yeah. and they're connecting to others. So what happens if their link is, is either uh, reduced in size or increased or removed? Yeah. So we, we hit on this already a little bit. Sea turtles are really important prey for a lot of things. A lot of beach animals eat them. Um, sharks, which are really important for the ecosystem, also feed on sea turtles. So, you know, as prey, they're an important part of the ecosystem. They're also important predators. They they feed on a lot of uh, benthic or bottom dwelling mollusks. They also eat jellyfish. So, something that is you know not so good for humans. Sea turtles of all species, especially the big leatherback turtles, eat jellyfish almost exclusively. So, as predators, they're really important, and they're also sort of ecosystem engineers in a lot of these systems. So. 
when you have sea turtles at high numbers, uh, for example, green turtles that feed on seagrass, okay. they actually graze that seagrass. So they'll clip it off, let it grow back up, and clip off that really new, nice tasting, you know, high, uh, high nutrient content seagrass. And so they're affecting these systems that are really important for ecological and economically important fish that live and grow up in those seagrass systems. So they, the, the millennia of green turtle being there, you know, all these other animals are adapted to how those turtles change the habitat. So I'd have to assume that the storms would affect that as well then. Um, it's certainly something that we're looking at, looking at NOAA's work and some of those uh, affiliated groups. Storms are going to get much more severe, but also more frequent. And so, how do we imagine this ripple effect happening? So, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing then we've got grass that isn't growing in the right way, then we've got um, these animals that aren't grazing in the right way, and then we're, we're losing our um, our feed <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that, that's available on up the food chain. So, then what we end up with is with an abundance in some species that are problematic and not being able to. That, that balance. Yeah. Well, I think what this hits on is, uh, you know, we focused on the Endangered Species Act, right? So you've got you've got legislation that's protecting, say, green trolls in this in this case. Yeah. So you're protecting the species, but you're not necessarily protecting the habitat they depend on. So in some of these yeah. seagrass systems, we've got a lot of turtles that are recovering from, from management. Now you've got them mowing down all the seagrass and even pulling up the rhizomes. That's like what causes the, the grass to grow back up. So you get these barren areas where the turtles have just decimated the, the seagrass. So you can't conserve the species without conserving the habitat. Yes, and this is something that was brought up yesterday very specifically um, because we were talking about wildlife conservation. So one of the problems we have is we've got people focused on singular, finite solutions. Yeah. We get the population to here, we've been successful. And we're going to worry about this species, but not these others. And so, as I like to say in government, we solved one problem and created another. Mm -hmm. And it is common, a lot of people don't understand how the, the money moves in government, but it's actually really important to the way the government ecosystem operates. So when Congress sends money to the executive branch, it comes in a line item. And because it comes in as a line item, it means that there is a goal. And it means that there is no in-between money, there is no holistic solution planning, and there is no looking for anything that has already been either created or considered that would be comparative. And you might imagine then how this causes a ripple effect of the exact same concept problem that we just described, where we have one office maybe that's how to win that an administration says, look, I did X, but this whole system then is left mm -hmm. to fall apart. And so what I observed when I was in the inside was that we had to do the same thing we're doing here, which is talk to all the experts. They know that we need to be doing this, or I have this to offer, that this is what I need in return. Frequently, what I found is that we had the majority of information that can be adjusted or complemented in other areas. But if you're not given permission to speak to the other groups, where they're not given permission to go outside their line item, we end up seeing the same exact problem where essentially it's not a species we're trying to save, it is a particular goal we're trying to suggest. Um, so it, it's the ecosystem concept, whether we're talking education or we're talking animals and environment or we're, we're talking government, all is the same thing. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can get people to think more system-wide instead of singular. Now, I know you collect a lot of data, and my understanding is that you have used that data not only to help the turtles, but to understand the biases or some of the assumptions that we make based on limited information. So talk to us a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, so with this with this data set that we collect on the Credit Research Project, we can not only use it to track the populations, but we can also look to say, okay, what if we look at the data in this way versus that way? What are our interpretations from those those data? And if we don't include these potential biases, how would our our, our, our inferences be be problematic? And also how would that how might that affect our you know management decisions down the line? So I use our data, um, 47 years, to, to answer those kind of questions. And we've done some work with colleagues around the world where we combine data sets and try to do it in multiple locations and see what kind of biases are there collectively in the way we monitor sea turtle populations. So if you give us two, what would you say are the two most pronounced? Um, let's see. Well, the two couple of things that, that I've worked on recently is um, you know how detection biases things. So. And whatever whatever science you're doing, or uh, 
any inference you're trying to make, if you if there's bias in the way you're detecting something you're counting, then your trends over time are going to be very um, be very skeptical of those trends if your if your detections are changing. So with sea turtles, when we first started, we were walking the beach. Um, now we have vehicles. So if you're going out there and you're missing turtles that you didn't know you were missing, then your trends can be biased. So what we, what we did in one of our papers was we looked at trends based on just counts. You know, how many turtles do we think are there just based on counts? And then we can run models to figure out well, who are we missing? Now what does the population trend look like? And it actually changed quite substantially when you correct for your ability to uh, detect things. And that goes across all, all science. That goes, yeah, I was going to say, so for our data geeks, that's type 1, type 2 error. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially, for our non-data geeks, when you find something that doesn't really exist because it appears to in a, in a small sample size, or when you fail to find something that actually is happening, and it could be for something such as you were walking with some drivers, so you simply didn't get where you needed to go. But we see it in all kinds of science spaces. Um, I did one research project where we looked at um, spatial abilities, and if you had damage to one part of your brain, how did it affect your spatial abilities? Well, over and over and over and over again, we found that it was catastrophic when you had damage in this area, except in a few, time, a few different samples. And we also, well, what's the difference? So we use something called a moderator variable. In this case, it was that they were collecting all the data on shrapnel patients who had been injured in military settings which meant it had mostly men. Uh, when women were hit, we saw the opposite, where there was not an effect on, on spatial abilities. So the brain can be very different, and therefore collecting that data becomes very important. The reason I think this is so, so important uh, for anyone, especially those who are not scientists, is we have a habit um, to try and explain things quickly. And if we find something that looks different, than what we've been explaining. You might hear someone say, we were supposed to eat butter and then we weren't supposed to eat butter and now we're back to eating butter again. And yeah. am I eating fat? Am I eating low carbs? Am I... It gets confusing. And why? Because the data appears to keep changing, but that's not actually what's happening. Yeah. Our ability to read or collect that data improves. And as my professor used to say, I reserve the right to get smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as we are able to collect better data, we're better able to inform the public. Yeah. It isn't really the case that information or reality is changing, but our ability to assess it. Yeah. Yeah. And an important part of science is that it's an ongoing thing. It's constantly being adjusted. And those biases, when we understand or identify a bias, then you can account for it in your next right. round of trial. So science is constantly evolving, but we're always working towards what is the factual answer. Yes, yes, I would agree. Um, so question, do you guys, where do you get your funding? So the volunteers that help us actually pay to come and volunteer for a week. It's a this is a great model. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's an eco vacation of sorts. So they come out for a week and they help us do the research. They live right alongside the biologists. We actually cook for them as well, um, and they they invest a, a week in the project. It's a wonderful experience, but it also supports us. About half of our funding comes from volunteer dues. Wow, that is a fantastic yeah. idea. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's worked out well for quite a while. Eco vacation. Yeah. I really like that. Interesting. Okay, that yeah, that, that's an innovative approach for sure. And then the other half of your funding comes from where? Uh, uh, private grants, uh, okay. corporate donations. We have a big fundraiser every fall. Um, T-shirt sales. Yeah. yeah. So we, we get a lot yeah. of uh, yeah, science grants. You know. So we get a lot of, we piece together the rest of that. And that you do you do any state level or, or federal level grants? We don't get any money from the state. The state of Texas, so. Okay. And is there a reason? Um, I'm not sure there's a specific reason. I mean, the, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we work on a national wildlife refuge, so right. they support us through and through with yeah. everything we're doing. But we never ask that we never apply for the funds for them. There's a specific reason I'm asking this. One of the things that I've said over and over again is you don't solve problems with regulation. You do so through facilitation. Just illustrate exactly what I was, what I was actually hoping was the case. A lot of people don't realize there's so much great stuff that's happening. And when government helps facilitate it, like the U.S. Wildlife um, works with you guys to create that space where you can get access and you can get your support, they're not actually investing money, but they are investing in you in a, in a way. 
Yeah. That's when we will see true culture change. Um, I have a tag on a lot of taglines. One of them is, uh, it doesn't take an act of Congress to fix the country. It just takes a lot of dedicated Americans uh -huh. to work together. Yeah. And this is one of those reasons why, is because you're, there's no assumption that you need federal dollars, but if there's an ability to connect programs, then we can inform, then government can do its job, which is to share the information. Absolutely. Yeah. So on that last point, um, and I'll, I'll wrap this up, one of the things that we hear frequently, single-use plastics, straws, uh, and, and a variety, host of other concerns with recycling, reuse, and then also reduce, which is a new word. What are your thoughts on that? And do those have direct connections to the Yeah, well, I mean, I've sort of thought that when the reduce, reuse, recycle movement started, um, it made it look like all three were the same, equivalent, and reduce should be way above uh, recycle. And so we're having a lot of issues with recycling, and certainly sea turtles are at the forefront of the issue in plastic in the ocean and on beaches because they get they get tangled in plastic on the beaches as well. Um, but we have a number of populations of sea turtles around the world that are very affected by marine plastics. They sea turtles, an adult turtle's brain is about the size of your thumb, so they're not very discerning animals, and they'll eat just about anything. Um, so we get a lot of plastic ingestion. There's obviously direct impacts where the turtles will choke and die, but there's indirect ones where the plastic accumulates in their guts and prevents them from doing the, their normal behaviors. So um, that's a, it's a big concern in the sea turtle world, and there's a number of people around the world who are not only trying to quantify its impact, but also try to understand better why sea turtles eat plastic, how they're attracted to them, both on a broad scale and at, also in a more specific scale when they're like in front of them. So there really is something about plastic that's going on as well. Yeah, so I'm actually doing some work with the University of North Carolina where we're testing the idea that sea turtles affect the smell. So yeah, you imagine yeah. these big garbage patches out in the right? open ocean, and marine organisms live on those on the garbage. So it's emitting a smell of living organisms. So if you're a turtle and you're miles away and you you smell above the water and you say hmm, that smells good, then you're attracted to to that garbage patch. It puts you in, in a you know conflict with with trying to you know keep these kind of things. Yeah. So tell me, this is something that I'm really trying to understand, and I, and I got some of it, which is if you're having your plastic straw and you're out on the town that night and it falls to the ground and it flies and it goes and goes and goes to the water, I got that. But when it gets to the land, you know, if you're if you are actually disposing of it properly, is that also going to go, or is it more the fly away? Yeah, I don't know the specific numbers okay. on this kind of stuff, and. Uh, it sure seems like a huge percentage of things that we think are recycling are not actually being recycled. And so they end up going to a landfill somewhere. And whether they're, they're, um, they maintain their, their size and get washed into the ocean or they become microplastic um, is certainly a possibility. What is microplastic? That's when the, your pl every time, even if you don't see the physical structure of plastic, it continually breaks down to smaller and smaller things. And so in the ocean, it turns into a soup. And when you have planktonic feeding organisms like the giant whale sharks and manta rays, they can't discern between their prey and those itty bitty pieces of plastic which are disrupting their, you know, the digestion of everything they're trying yeah. to eat. So a lot of, uh, a lot of filter feeding organisms have a lot of problems with, with microplastics. Yeah, so that's even us trying to break things down but also not doing it. It's going to yeah. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of this great information. Uh, we will be back tomorrow about the same time, about 1 o'clock, and uh, tomorrow we'll be in Charleston. But please, if you have any questions, send them our way, and we will pass them on. And that's it for today.